Hey there, and welcome back to RimWorld. My name is Pete, and today we complete another episode of our RimWorld adventure in the tropical rainforest with the Believers of Boyo. Last time we left off after celebrating Ellie's birthday to a small child, and after also defending ourselves from another siege, a siege that ended with us taking a prisoner. We also tamed a few boomalopes and already had our first offspring, and as you can see here, we have more good news from our animals. Our elephant, the Earl of Bronze, has finally been trained in the art of hauling, which I imagine will prove to be quite useful. Now, while we are still under the influence of an EMI field, let's do some work around the base. At the moment, our butchering room is getting a slight expansion, while we are waiting for some of our people to be ready to go on their next big adventure, because of course we want to shut down that EMI field as soon as we can, not to mention that we also received a quest last episode that would have us a rescue maniac from the last series, and at least judging from the comments, the overwhelming majority of you were in favor of taking that, so that would be another thing to tackle here today. Now, you may have noticed the episode's first day here rather uneventful. I have also taken to heart the comments pointing out that some of our mountain base is a bit hard to see on video, so I'll do my best to light up those areas that we frequent the most. And I have to admit, I just have a thing for those dark light braziers. They just give an underground colony that certain special vibe, and I think I would like to keep that going, at least for the time being. In the early morning hours of the next day then, our prisoner is successfully enslaved, and that means, first of all, we have to give out yet another name from the list of patron supporters in the naming rights tier and above. And the name that was randomly chosen for our very first slave here is Tiffy. So congratulations, I guess, and welcome to the colony. A quick reminder then here on who Tiffy is, a delicate wimp genie with the annoying voice and tortured artist traits, surprisingly good with animals, considering that genies actually have a gene that does the opposite, and potentially also a capable researcher or hunter, Although, unfortunately, slaves can't research, and I do not know how I feel about giving her a gun. And so instead, to start things off, she'll put her elongated fingers to good use at the butcher table, at least until Took has fully recovered from his encounter with those rhinos last episode. And just a quick note on the believers of Boyo taking slaves, because I saw in the comments that that was apparently a bit of a divisive topic. Keep in mind that the meme at the core of our ideology is called guilty and not charity, and so I think it's all about repenting for one's sins, and, well, if others don't do so voluntarily, then perhaps they must be made to do so. Still, I have a feeling that this could be an ongoing theme with this series, searching for what we actually are and what we want our core principles to be. But just for the moment, rest assured that we won't have a full-blown slave camp here. Slaves will be treated just like regular pawns with their own bedrooms. As a matter of fact, you can currently see Wyatt mine that one out. So, going along with what one of the comments on the last episode said, consider this whole slavery thing more like penance, perhaps. At the moment, that might simply be what our colonists deem to be the most suitable punishment for those that attack us. But that's the beauty of RimWorld, none of that is actually set in stone, so who knows where we end up in 5 or 10 episodes. Now, where we will end up in a few moments is at the end of a hopefully successful pain party. The cooldown has once again worn off, so let's take this chance for at least another ideology development point. A good way to introduce Tiffy to the ways of our beliefs, and perhaps also a good way to obtain a small mood bonus, as we are very soon going to send out a small caravan, and of course we want them to stay happy along their journey. And indeed, the pain party is a success, and we increase our ideology development points to 9. This time, we do not get another colonist out of it, but I think that's just fine. After all, I also don't want to introduce new people too frequently. Now, one more thing we are currently building, or rather building again, is a hand tailoring bench, as we want to be able to manufacture at least a few clothing items for Tiffy, and it could take us a few more days until the EMI field is finally disabled. In the evening then, something happens that once again touches upon the whole slavery topic, as Kevin suffers a mental break because we have actually enslaved someone. Yes, for the believers of Boyo, slavery is actually disapproved, but at least to me that does not necessarily mean that our colonists won't do it, or rather, the fact that they don't like it either might make it fit even better. In a sense, they are now suffering together with the enslaved, and they once again become guilty themselves, just to help someone else repent for their guilt. At least, that is how you could spin it. Once again, let me know what you think about this. In the meantime, Light has used his creativity inspiration to make a masterwork small sculpture. It is titled Artwork with Exhaustion, an artwork of a utility bot sitting on a table playing roulette with a large group of politicians. 
Not really a concrete reference to anything, I believe, and so we'll just put it up in our common room, which is still extremely impressive, although we will make some slight changes later in this episode too. On the following morning though, it is first of all time to launch a caravan. Let us now take out that EMI dynamo, and as usual, we'll send out our adventuring party of Light and Wyatt, accompanied by our two donkeys, Glomus and Blossom. If you recall, Loris here unfortunately underwent a rather painful sterilization procedure, and as a result, no longer has all four of his hoofs. The list of supplies then rather large, especially the 20 packaged survival meals, but don't worry, it is all with good reason. And so, while a freshly recovered Took spends his morning hunting boomaloops in the rain, Light and Wyatt take an equally wet path to exit the map, although they will most likely not make it to their destination before sundown. Our penitent Tiffy, meanwhile, is bestowed a new outfit, elephant leather shirt and pants to keep her nice and protected, and because we're civilized like that, but also a slave body strap and a slave collar, just to make it very clear that she is not a fully-fledged part of this colony, and from a gameplay mechanic standpoint to keep her nice and suppressed and make sure that she does not rebel. In the evening then, it is time for another sterilization, although luckily this time Kevin succeeds on his first attempt. The reason behind this, our bears can now finally also haul, but if we want them to do that, it will realistically not be possible to keep them separate from each other. So in my opinion, this here the best way to ensure that we are not building up Bear Army version 2.0. On the next morning then, you can see we are beginning to smooth the walls inside of our common room. This is obviously going to take a while, but even the believers of Boyo have standards. A short moment later then, our caravan arrives at the destination. We can see the building housing the dynamo very clearly in the middle here, and as advertised, it is protected by four mechanoids, one pikeman and three tesserons. And these tesserons are nasty, as they fire a continuous beam that sets everything on fire, but at the moment, they are dormant and that allows us to sneak up on them, because in melee combat, they are really not all that strong, and that is something that we will use to our advantage here. So while Light Berserk pulses the two at the top, Wyatt starts hacking away at the one at the bottom. And you can also see here just how incredibly flimsy they are, just one psychic slug immediately downs one of them, so let's keep shooting at the second one, who is now focusing in on Wyatt. And just before the beam goes off, enemy number two is defeated as well. At this point though, the pike man is moving in and so Light gets himself out of dodge. Wyatt is still protected by the building here and the third tesseron is now also defeated. Although the pike man is seemingly not really interested in coming any closer. And so I think we'll have to engage it ourselves now. And just to be safe, we'll do so utilizing the skip psychast instantly closing into melee range, and while the pikeman has a few more hit points compared to the tesseron, it is still completely outmatched in a melee fight. And so we should see this one end in our favor soon. And there we are, that's all enemies on the map defeated, as you can see Wyatt only took a few small injuries, and at this point we will in fact already reform our caravan, at least half of it. Yes, Light and Glomus will already return back home at this point, However, as you can see, they are leaving behind pretty much all of our supplies, as Wyatt's journey will continue for just a little while longer. After patching up his injuries, Wyatt now goes to work on the EMI dynamo, and after a good hour of hacking away at it, the thing violently explodes, thankfully though while not causing any further injuries to Wyatt. So, at this point, it's time to reform the second half of our caravan, but not to go back home. Instead, we will continue our journey towards the prisoner camp over here, the prisoner camp where Maniac is being held. The journey over there will take us an additional two days, and that is why we brought all of those meals with us, but also because we might actually remain on that tile for a day or two. You'll see what I mean in due time. Back home, meanwhile, the power is back and so our workshop is currently being expanded. And just in that moment, Wyatt runs into a friendly caravan. Unfortunately though, there's not really much we can do in terms of trading here. I would have liked to purchase some Nutriamin, but we did not bring any silver with us. And we also cannot really afford to sell any of the goods we have. And so I suppose we'll just keep moving. Back home, meanwhile, we are now moving our research bench into the expanded workshop. The reason for this is simple, it counts as a work facility, and as such, it is considered disrespectful to our shameful shrine, and of course, we can't have that. The night then sets in with a flash storm, let's see how much damage this does, and well, skipping ahead a few hours, I can tell you quite a bit, but of course, as is always the case, the jungle will recover. On the next morning then, we are visited by a tribal war merchant, 
And this presents a great opportunity for us to sell some stuff, mostly insect jelly and a few old weapons and clothing items. Unfortunately, they did not have anything of value to purchase. The plasteel breech axe here might look intriguing at first, but for this weapon the steel version would actually be preferred, so the price tag might be a bit misleading here. The fire, meanwhile, keeps spreading, the anima tree of course immune to it. And just like that, a tribal shaman merchant now arrives as well. So let's find out what they have to offer. Alright, now this time we are grabbing some of that Nutriamine as well as a Psychic Shock Lance because you can never have enough of those. In exchange we are selling some of the spare drugs as well as the remainder of the insect jelly. In my opinion, a very worthwhile trade. A short while later then another caravan arrives, this one however just our own. Light has returned and with him has Donkey Glomus. In the evening then we have some rain setting in and with that the end to the forest fire, as inside of our common room we are now constructing four marble columns. These are also required as part of the shameful shrine, which I think will eventually move into a separate room, but for now, while we still have the space, we might as well keep it all in one. The columns then obviously also helping out with the room's beauty rating, although at this point we are still quite far away from actually achieving unbelievably impressive status, and who knows whether or not we'll ever get there. For now at least we have yet another trader arrive, this one a combat supplier, and that means they hopefully have plenty of interesting items for us. And indeed we are selling off a lot of inventory here, including some rather valuable pieces, because one of the items that these guys have for sale is an Eltex staff, this thing costs almost 3000 silver, but this is one of the only ways to obtain it, and I imagine a certain psycaster named Light would very much appreciate it. Before we can even equip it though, Randy sends yet another group of visitors our way. This time, however, it is only a small group of travelers without any pack animals, and I think at this point it suffices to say that they did not have anything of interest to us. So instead, let's watch as Light now equips his new Eltex staff, which now further increases his neural heat level by a good 30 points, basically another free use of the skip sidecast. Squeaks then also finishes our fourth and final column, and with that we no longer have a disrespected shameful shrine, and so we can give her a new task, and that is to tame ourselves a second elephant. I think the Earl of Bronze has earned himself some companionship, not to mention that eventually I could see the Believers of Boyo move over to elephants exclusively, simply because they can be used for pretty much everything. As you can see though, the first two taming attempts here unfortunately fail, but luckily there is a larger group here and they are all females, and Squeaks also has enough kibble with her to go for attempt number three here, and that one succeeds. And so let's name ourselves another elephant, this one will now be named Rotona, once again, of course, after the patron supporter of the same name. A few hours later then, one of the untamed elephants takes revenge, not at our taming attempts, but at took shooting at it, but luckily we have already done enough damage to outrun and eventually kill the animal. As Tuk then continues the hunt, a group of rare thrombos wanders in, a grand total of six of them, which would be an incredibly lovely haul, provided of course we can somehow take them down. At least for the moment though, we have bigger concerns, not only is Tuk once again running from a man-hunting animal, but Wyatt has also been ambushed by crazed guinea pigs, which of course are no match for him as he clearly displays here, but one of them does get in a quick scratch, definitely an avoidable injury. Still, it is quickly patched up and Wyatt continues along his way, and eventually he reaches the prisoner camp in the evening. Now, what we can see here is a relatively small camp, but heavily fortified for its size, currently protected by two waster pirates, one of them already manning the water, with Maniac held prisoner in a small stone building. A look at his traits and skills also confirms this is the Maniac that we all know and love, although, as you can see, getting to him might be a tad bit difficult, as our two enemies are backed up by 11 turrets. At least the first of those, however, we should be able to take out relatively easily, as we can simply hack our way through the limestone wall directly adjacent to it. At this point I also realized that Wyatt is apparently no longer wearing his shield belt, I assume for some reason Ellie has snatched that for herself, either way we still managed to get in here without being shot, and Wyatt actually also makes a full recovery in the process of destroying this first gun turret. Now, that leaves 10 more, but at least the mortar fire has stopped. Still, I don't think we're going to take on all of these, especially also if we consider that Wyatt does not have enough psi focus to cast the smoke pop psi cast, 
So how about we do things a little differently and just dig our way through to Maniac? Although for the moment let's have Wyatt take a nap, our enemies don't really seem to care about our presence and this hopefully reduces the risk of suffering a mental break at the worst possible moment. On the following morning then, after a hearty meal, Wyatt is set to meditate. I would prefer to get at least one charge of the smoke pop psycast, and for that we need a psi focus level of 25%. Back at home at the colony of Rat Chapel, meanwhile, we still have some thrombos roaming around, and I think it's high time that we hunt them down, or rather to let them hunt themselves, as one cast of the Berserk Pulse psycast here causes a thrombo to go manhunter, and shortly after we can watch two of them fight it out, and thankfully, at least for us, this fight will not stop until one of them goes down. The surviving animal is then hunted down by Took and does not particularly like that. However, having suffered a brutal amount of injuries, all of this comes just a little bit too late. And so the first two thrombos are now ours, only four more to go. And well, for two of those, we are proceeding exactly the same way we did before. One more berserk pulse and that should be two more dead in just a moment. You may have also noticed the notification in the top left corner earlier. At least one of the pirates is currently in the process of attacking Wyatt, albeit, as you can see, with very little success. Enemy number two, meanwhile, does not really want to engage, so we'll just make them come to us. And once again, the fight is over in mere seconds. Although this time, the dead body spews out a cloud of tox gas, which unfortunately starts to affect Wyatt immediately. Now luckily the buildup is nothing serious yet, and with that the area is actually also cleared of enemies, which brings us to the reason why we're here, breaking out Maniac. However, before we can get to that, we have yet another name to give out, as another Boomalope has seen the light of day. This one here will now be named Elva, as always after the patron supporter of the same name. Wyatt, meanwhile, is currently carving a neat little path through the mountain to get to Maniac. This helps us circumvent most of the turrets in the area. And for the few that can target us from here, we have one charge of the smoke pop ability left. So let's plop that down and then go to work on the wall. And it doesn't take long until that's destroyed and Maniac is freed. And there we are, Maniac is back, at least for the moment. At this point, there is definitely the big question what to do with him. As you can see, he is neither a believer of Boyo nor a member of the Cult of Jinx. Instead, he has been converted to the Moral View ideology, a supremacist raider belief system, quite the opposite of what we are currently playing as. Now, we'll talk a bit more about what to do with Maniac in due time. For now, at least, the fight is not over yet. So we can now watch the two of them destroy some of the infrastructure powering the turrets. Who knows, maybe we can once again haul some of them back to use ourselves. And so, under the cover of darkness and another smoke pop, we can watch Wyatt continue his anti-electrical rampage, while Maniac has looped around the northern side of the prison camp. And with the battery here now destroyed, the area is deemed safe, and that means we are technically good to go. However, we are not going to do that just yet, instead we're actually going to stay the night. But then again, we shouldn't stick around for too long, as we will have enemy reinforcements appear in about four days. But I think that is plenty of time to accomplish what I have planned. And what I have planned is probably quickly revealed here, as we can see Maniac deconstruct all of those turrets. And on the following morning, we can also see him bury one of the fallen enemies, which now turns this sarcophagus here into a lovely meditation spot. And that will be quite useful for the person currently berserk pulsing the last two thrombos here, who can now spend 70% of his psi focus to fast skip himself over to Wyatt and Maniac. Now, the problem is, fast skipping is also how we want to get back home, as carrying all of those turrets back on foot would take us about five days, even with a donkey, and so Light will now spend the entire next day in meditation, until his psi focus has once again reached that 70% threshold. Back home, meanwhile, Tiffy has made a shade cone for herself, just to get her temperature resistance up a bit, but also because it does give her a rather distinct look, and for better or worse, we do want her to stand out a bit. Up in the cave system here, Took has now also killed the fifth thrombo, while over in the pirate camp we are dismantling sandbags for cloth. After all, it doesn't weigh much, and there are a few objects in the game where cloth cannot be substituted for leathers or other materials. As the sun slowly sets, light then at roughly 50% psi focus, so it will take him a few more hours, hours during which we receive another quest. And considering that it has hospitality in its title, I think it's a no-brainer that we'll take this. Entertaining a dame from the Empire for 10 days should not be too much trouble for us. 
First of all though, let's send our adventuring party back home. Light has finally reached the necessary level of psi focus, and so we can now reform the caravan. This is important because Far Skip does not actually skip animals or items, unless used by someone who is part of an already active caravan. And so, hauling back a grand total of 8 turrets and a mortar, we begin the return trip. A return trip that is sped up significantly now by using the Far Skip Psycast. And just like that, Light, Wyatt, Maniac and Donkey Blossom have safely made it back home. Maniac also immediately begins equipping himself in marine armor. Despite the fact that over a year has now passed since we left the Cult of Jinx, he seemingly feels right at home. But whether or not he remains with us long term is still very much up for debate. For the time being, we'll do our best to at least convert him over to the Believers of Boyo. And until that happens, he might just fill the role of the weird uncle at Thanksgiving. You know, the one who's just weirdly different about most things, but you have to tolerate them. And I could very much see Maniac in that role. Just waltzing in here with his supremacist raider beliefs and deciding that this is now his home. Perhaps a good test to see how far our hospitality extends after all. To take our mind off of this then, a local monkey once again goes mad. But as you can see, it is successfully defeated by a small group of visitors. Visitors with whom we then promptly exchange some of our components for all of their silver. After all, who knows when the next proper caravan arrives, and I think it would be best to be prepared for that. Now, for our Imperial guest, we are also currently in the process of carving out a nice large bedroom. Having three people on mining duty definitely speeds this up significantly, although I accidentally made this room even bigger than it had to be, as I misread the impressiveness requirement of 40 for a room size requirement, but I somehow doubt that our royal guest will complain. Now, what she might complain about is a psychic droner harassing all females in our colony. So we might want to get that one destroyed before she arrives. And considering that it's protected by 8 enemies, we might actually want to enlist the help of Maniac for this one too. Keep in mind that mining and fighting things is pretty much all that he's good at. Still, for now, we are not going to launch a caravan just yet. Instead, we are once again visited by one. And so, on the next morning, we can send out Kevin to have a chat with them. Now, unfortunately, they don't really have anything of interest to us, so instead we'll just do our best to make the most of the absolute plethora of thrombo meat we currently have. We won't be able to use all of that before it spoils anyway, so we are selling some of it here and exchange it for rice, which we can then use to turn the remaining meat into pemmican or kibble, just to ensure that we waste as little of it as possible. And we do actually also have more meat coming in, as Maniac is currently on hunting duty. Unfortunately though, he is about to be charged by an angry elephant, at least he would be if it weren't for his one and only stun psycast, which allows him to just get out of dodge, at least until Light can get him into safety. At this point then, the trade caravan takes over, with predictable results. And so, having almost depleted our supply of thrombo meat, we now switch back to elephant. In the afternoon then, it is time for the next cocoa harvest. And a few hours later, it is then in fact Maniac himself, with an intellectual skill of only 7, unlocking the secrets of xenogenetics. Now at this point, once again, the question is what to research next, and while I would appreciate your input on this, I am actually leaning heavily towards continuing straight away with microelectronics, as I don't really think that most of the stuff between electricity and microelectronics will be immediately useful for us, while microelectronics itself unlocks a few things that would be very much of interest for the believers of Boyo. And I am not only talking about the orbital trade beacon and the comms console, but of course also about transport parts, the ability to make medicine or hospital beds, all of which I think might just be very fitting for us. But again, let me know what you think we should do next here. Our colonists at least are celebrating this milestone with a party. A party that we can use as a nice backdrop to also talk about the hospitality quest, because I think we'll take the honor as a reward, and my proposal to you would be to give it to Brandon. Now obviously, Wyatt with the title of Freeholder might be the more suitable candidate, but I actually think that he is a knight more in function than in rank, not to mention he's also already a level 6 psycaster, while Brandon here is psychically sensitive and has no other way of obtaining them, not to mention that he actually spent his very first days as a colonist with the Empire on a quest, so he might have already gotten a taste of the Imperial lifestyle, and who knows, he might just want to have more of it. Finally then, the big question is what to do with Maniac. As you can see here, not only does he follow a supremacist radar ideology, he is actually also incapable of caring. And again, it has been over a year since he was an actual companion to our colonists, so I'm not entirely sure if our people would be comfortable with him sticking around. Then again, being uncomfortable for the sake of helping others, that is very much what the believers of Boyo are all about. So in this question too, I would like to hear what you think we should do. 
And so, as the party comes to an end, so does today's episode, with Maniac currently occupying our hospital, but who knows for how much longer. For today then, let's make the cut, and as always, we'll do so with some fan art. And this week, our youngest, Ellie, received some attention. First by Gracie, who made this absolutely adorable artwork of her. I particularly love the small blue elephant on the shirt there. It reminds me a bit of the Astrid Lindgren books we read earlier when we were children. Not quite sure how much of a thing that was outside of Germany and Scandinavia. It was simply one of the first thoughts I had when I saw this. We also had two submissions by Synthos117, both of them also featuring Ellie in the cave environment. Full disclosure though, these two are AI generated, and for now I am still fine with featuring the occasional AI piece, but please don't send in too many of them too frequently. Not that I don't appreciate you creating something for this series, but AI art just has a different creative threshold, if you will, and I just feel it wouldn't be fair to those who sit down to actually draw something. And one of those people who now quite regularly sits down to draw something is Isaac Young. Here with a depiction of the perhaps not quite so happy family of Ellie, Squigs and Took. And once again, Isaac sent me a rather lengthy deep dive into these characters, which you can also once again find in a comment down below, just like in the last episode. And finally, yes, there is one more. We have this lovely rendition of Wyatt with his plasma sword. With Wyatt looking absolutely majestic, like the knight that he will perhaps never be. Again, at least not in rank, but definitely in function. The Art Duke who sent this in, by the way, also does commissions, so if you're interested in that, then perhaps send them a message. And with that, I think we're done for today. Once again, thank you all so much for submitting your artwork, and I hope that you enjoyed the episode, and if you did, then I would be very happy if you could leave a thumbs up. If you like what I'm doing and want to support me and my channel further, then you can of course go ahead and subscribe to stay up to date, grab some merch over on shop.peatcomplete.com, or check out and maybe even pledge to the Pete Complete Patreon. Thank you all for watching and I'll see you next time. Cheers.